Would you like light meat or dark? And I'm not just talking about your hosts. Grab your sword, pull it hard, and let's head for dry land. Welcome to Channel 8 and a Half. Hello and thank you for joining us at Channel 8 and a Half, a show about movies and TV and pop culture. My name is Joe Galena. And I'm Andrew Hanna. Andrew, how are you doing today? Joe, I'm doing great. Today is Watchlist Volume 3. We're doing a watch list. Where we talk about all the things we've been watching this week. It's a list of what we've been watching. It's called Watchlist. It's in the title. Andrew, I watched recently the new Netflix show that was apparently one of the most highly viewed shows, according to Netflix, in the country called Cursed. Have you heard of this show before? I've heard of it. I watched the trailer, but I did not watch a frame of it. It's fine. So Cursed is a retelling of the Arthurian legend, the sword and the stone myth. However, it's told from a different perspective. It's told as if uh, a lady, a female, was chosen as the rightful king of England, pulls the sword from the stone. Mm -hmm. Oh, the subversion, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, it seemed very much a uh, millennial retelling of this story. <laughs> it kind of is. And you know yeah. what? I love an Arthurian legend. I love knights. I love horseback riding and sieges and men with giant beards eating large turkey legs and drinking mead out of a rhinoceros horn. I love it all. <laughs> and so I was primed to really enjoy this show. And when you say it's kind of a millennial retelling, it kind of is. It's told yeah. from the perspective, and I say that quite literally as a millennial retelling, as a, my first thought was the MTV version of this type of show, and I don't mean that in a great way. It takes it from the perspective of actually one of the villains normally in an Arthurian legend. Nim Wei is the main mm -hmm. character, and she is also called the Lady of the Lake. She is a sorceress in traditional Arthurian legend. She is the one who, conflicting reports you know, on Nimue. What is, what is the quote from the Holy Grail? Uh, strange women lying in ponds, distributing swords is no system of government. <laughs> but yeah, she does. So she's the one in Avalon and is prepared to give King Arthur when he comes back and leads England into the future. She's going to be there waiting for him. She will also, she will also in some versions of the story entomb Merlin uh, she will either fall in love with him, she will seduce him, she'll trap him in a rock. You know, she's just doing a lot of stuff, but primarily the antagonist. In this story, she is the heroine. Interesting, okay. It would be interesting, but really it just feels like a lot of filler for the whole time. This show is, I have only gotten halfway through it, I will be honest with you, and even by episode two, it felt like they were filling for time. They focus a lot on Nim Wei, played by Catherine Langford from 13 Reasons Why. She's a mm. very good actress, and she does well. I like her performance, but there's just not a lot of excitement in the show, or it's too drawn out. It takes far too long to do things. It flashes back a lot to her past, and showing her as this sorceress who's not you know, understood by her druid tribe. And oh, she's an outcast. Yeah, it's interesting, because you see a lot of similar stories set in sort of the middle ages yes. coming out these days. And I feel as though it's on multiple fronts. Netflix is trying to recreate the phenomena that was Game of Thrones with this and The Witcher. Do you feel like this was another one of those attempts to, to try to recreate that? I don't think you can recreate the phenomenon that was Game of Thrones because it's funny when you mention The Witcher because The Witcher is also something I thought of. It feels like a real PG-13 version of The Witcher. It feels like yeah. a, y a YA adaptation when those were really popular of Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. And I mean that in kind of a pejorative way of what you would think of as the cliche type of story because yeah. it does hit those beats, but it just, it feels like there was both a ton of money spent on it. And then sometimes it feels like it was shot in someone's backyard. It mm -hmm. just didn't hook me. And I don't think it's worth going back to. It doesn't even tell the story that it's trying to tell in a compelling way. Yeah. It feels as though, and let me, let me preface this as a man of color. I appreciate that there is an effort to retell the stories that are 
the cornerstones of our culture with the inclusion of peoples that were otherwise neglected in these stories and introducing different perspectives in gender and race mm -hmm. in the same way that Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse did with Miles Morales. Spider Man being a black kid. Miles Morales also got his own video game. Uh the Marvel Spider-Man video game from came out a couple years ago. There mm -hmm. was a re-release, an update with Miles Morales as the main character. And Miles Morales in the next one, when it gets released, is gonna be one of the main characters in it. Just to let you know. And I yeah, and and I love that it's becoming more accepted, even if it diverts from the original stories. For instance, I would have loved to have seen an Idris Elba 007, but it feels as though in this case and in many cases with films and television shows that set out on this mission of inclusion, it becomes the primary focus and isn't also trying to build upon the original story and improve on it. Instead, they, they use it as a crutch, I feel. It did feel like a crutch. It felt like they tried to take a different perspective on it. And it was based on a comic book. It was based on a book that focuses on Nimue as this King Arthur, you know, surrogate. But everything else around it was built in a very cliche way. Although King Arthur in the story, she does run into King Arthur and he is black. So I guess that's something new. Even then, though, the they don't do anything really with King Arthur. He is still very much King Arthur, as you would know, you know, noble. He sings a, a really fair song in the beginning and he's <laughs> oh, so God. dreamy. Oh, he is. And immediately, you know, Nimue and, and King Arthur, they're making eyes at each other. And Nimue does have a best friend character named Pim in it. And she is great because she plays almost like a romantic comedy best friend in this medieval fantasy land and oh, she was wonderful okay. i really enjoyed her every time she was yeah. on screen i really enjoyed her but everything else around it was so bland it was a shame because focusing on a female protagonist in this way but also someone who will become a villain could have been great which I actually think hurts those of us who are usually not represented on screen. It, it isn't just enough to say, hey, look, we have a female lead and King Arthur is black. It should also be a story worth telling or I, I guess retelling in this case. And in the same way that Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse was great. And you know me, I don't usually like superhero films, but this told a compelling story without banking on the aspect of Spider-Man being black. But my question to you is, do you feel this might have the potential of getting better, that it's just still finding its voice, or do, do you feel like it's already hopeless? I don't think the foundation is doomed from the start because the story that it's based around, the foundation of it, is a story that's quite literally the origin story of England. It's been told mm -hmm. for hundreds and hundreds of years. And if you stick to that storyline, you can find gold within it. And they do do some things that I really like. Merlin is also, he is the Merlin in setting that we know from legend. He is the advisor to the king. He's a magician. But in this one, he's kind of just a drunk obnoxious bastard like he's just yeah. kind of a an off-putting dude and that's the a different version of merlin than we've ever seen merlin is usually you know the sword and the stone he's whimsical yeah. and he's fun you know dumbledore very early dumbledore in harry potter is basically merlin you know he is the wise mentor character the obi-wan kenobi seeing him as a drunk asshole was nice i liked what they did with him did you finish the entire season no i got about halfway through of it i was not compelled to go back the episodes are pretty long They're, how long are they 45 to 50 minutes so not in, not incredibly long for netflix standards the pilot was i think an hour but so still kind of like five, five episodes in yeah i got five episodes in i might finish it i might finish it i'm not sure I'm not compelled enough to go back, and that's not good when you're five episodes in. Yeah, I mean, I will usually give a show three to five episodes. If if it doesn't hook me within that time frame, then I will likely abandon it. The Witcher did take me a while to get into, but The Witcher was doing something so different that it was cutting back and forth between these timelines that I had no idea what was going on for most of The Witcher, and I think that's what kept me watching it. Because you're interested to see where it's going. Yeah. And also, I had talked to people about The Witcher who told me to keep going. Nobody, I have not talked to anybody about this show. It's quarantine. I haven't talked to anybody, period. 
I talk to the walls. They are closing in on me. We will all, <laughs> we will all be consumed by the walls. But there were people that I would talk to and go, oh, did you watch The Witcher? Yeah. What's going on? You'll see. Don't worry. That did the... The talking to people and the talking about what's going on, the theorizing did keep it going for me in a lot of ways that Game of Thrones did too. the theorizing, especially in the last couple of seasons. Yeah, that's a good point. I I feel like a lot of times that's part of the experience of watching a show like Game of Thrones, where some people have read the books and they provide more detailed insight in what's presented in the books. But also, like you said, the, the theorizing is part of the fun. I, I felt like that was half the fun with Lost as well. But the conversations definitely add to the show. Yeah, this did not have that, unfortunately. And I think it suffers for it. Yeah, I I don't know that I'll actually check it out. It, it didn't really pique my interest. You don't need to watch it. You can go for the <laughs> rest of your life without, things, <laughs> without watching it and you'll be True. fine. True. Cursed, eh. It's a mediocre shrug for me. Although it's probably going to get a second season because I guess Netflix says that it was very popular. I wonder if it can sustain that popularity, though, or if this is because it's new. The initial push that Netflix gives it because it's it's big new show. So it just puts it on everybody's main page and says, watch this. Watch this. We're Netflix or we'll come to your house. We're coming through the walls. (laughs) Yeah. Like the Kool-Aid man. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I think Netflix knows me well enough, though, not to put something like this in front of me because I hadn't heard of it until you told me you were going to talk about it. What does Netflix recommend to you? Uh, Let's see. I can actually check right now. Oh, the first one is The Last Dance. Oh, a sports documentary. Yeah, surprising for me, right? Well, I actually watched the Iverson documentary, and I like that a lot. The Iverson documentary, is that's one of the best ones. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Believe it or not, it was... Post Malone's song, White Iverson, that sparked my interest to check it out. Oh, really? Yeah, because in the song, he it sort of has this melancholy mood to it. And he says, uh, I, I started bawling when I was young. You won't think about me when I'm gone. I want that money like that ring I never won. And so I remember hearing Iverson's name a lot growing up. I, di- I don't really follow sports and I didn't when I was growing up. But I recall that I suddenly stopped hearing his name. And so i came across the documentary when I was looking into his story and put it on one day. And I thought it his story was so interesting and tragic. And it told the story of the tumultuous relationship he had with the media and that in a way it was very much his undoing where they built him up and then began to break him down. And in the way that media does, I, I guess with prodigies of our time, where they'll hype them up and then just hang on every action when they're at their peak, looking for the chink in the armor and waiting for what they think is an eventual fall from grace. But yeah, I, I, I thought his story was very interesting and, and the documentary is great. And as you know, I don't usually follow sports, but I, I do love the stories behind uh, the the athletes and the teams. And I, I also, I'll tune in for playoffs and championships because I love the high stakes and the drama that comes with it. Yeah, you're not tuning into. Tuesday night baseball game where both teams are under 500 and they got the number five pitcher going. No, 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 not at all. (laughs) But I did enjoy that documentary. You know what Netflix recommends to me? Sitcoms about schlubby guys not doing a lot and British shows where they bake cakes. I guess that tells you a lot about me. (laughs) What does Netflix, what does Netflix say about you? We can all just shamefully turn our heads down and just not talk about it. Yeah, yeah, that's it's like your search history. Don't ask, don't tell. Exactly. Let's just ignore it. It's not awkward if we don't make it awkward, guys. Speaking of things that you can likely go through your life without watching. Yes. We watched Waterworld. Yes, we did. Waterworld, the Kevin Costner movie from 1995, came out 25 years ago. 25 years ago last week. 1995, yeah. But we wanted to, for this watch list episode to check it out because neither of us had ever seen it and it is a notorious disaster among blockbuster filmmaking i was surprised that you hadn't seen it i had not seen it i was surprised i I hadn't seen it either it it makes sense we were five or six when it came out but what do you think joe just from what you saw on screen was it as disastrous as it was painted to be no it wasn't as disastrous as it painted to be however when you you are high (laughs) When you Google Waterworld, <laughs> literally the first result that comes up is 
why was Waterworld so bad? And I didn't think it was the worst thing in cinema history. Apparently you did. No, I didn't think it was the worst thing in cinema history. I, I think it's just, you can see the tug of war that was going on in the background play out on screen. It, it didn't feel like it knew where it was going. And that was very apparent. And I kind of looked into the background and the production issues that it suffered from. Oh, yes. Uh, so Waterworld initially started as... A Mad Max ripoff. Yeah, basically, Peter Ratter was hired to write a B-movie knockoff of Mad Max 2. Mm-hmm. And it was for Roger Corman's production company, but they only wanted to spend $3 million. <laughs> And he ended up pitching Mad Max on water and was subsequently turned down because they're like, oh, a movie that takes place on water, that's at least $5 million. Little did they know it became the most expensive film made in cinema history at the time, which was $175 million. And Ratter ended up writing it anyway. And a few producers came and went and they finally sold it to Universal Pictures. And at the time, Kevin Costner and the director, Kevin Reynolds, Mm -hmm. were separately interested in the film. But they refused to work together because of past squabbles they had on, on the set of Dances with Wolves, where... Costner was directing it and Reynolds was basically his advisor on set. And then later on Robin Hood, where they feuded over Costner's insistence on a terrible English accent and his personal irritation that Alan Rickman was getting too much screen time. Kevin Reynolds had a great quote that I read where he said, (laughs) I know which one you're talking about. Kevin Costner should only work on movies that Kevin Costner directs so that then he can then work with his favorite actor and director. (laughs) It's so gold. Uh, Yeah, I I really love that that quote because he walked off of Robin Hood and then ended up walking off of this as well in the editing process. Yes. But because of their past successful collaborations, they were convinced by the producers to just bury the hatchet, which they did, but only to feud on set once more because Reynolds wanted to make this epic action film that rivaled anything that was made in the last decade whereas Costner wanted to make this character piece and you can really see that tug of war on screen where it felt as though it was fighting with itself the the characters weren't consistent overall at times it got really boring I think Kevin Costner's character was consistent consistently awful I completely agree (laughs) but I think they also didn't have a finished script they actually hired Joss Whedon who was just coming off of speed to do rewrites yeah And he was only hired for one week, ended up spending six weeks on the production, which he called Six Weeks from Hell. But I had no idea, Costner, because all I know about Waterworld is what I learned from the Universal Studios show, which I love and I think had a better story than this, (laughs) or at least even better special effects. Boy, did Universal back the wrong horse because they said, (laughs) Waterworld, oh, it's going to be a hit. Watch out. Waterworld toys, Waterworld action figures, Waterworld ride. You want a Waterworld pillow so you could sleep on Kevin Costner's face? Go for it. Here you go. <laughs> and then Waterworld the movie came out and it was mm, a disappointment. I don't think the show, I, I honestly think the the live show was Universal trying to recoup some of the costs <laughs> by just taking the big giant set that they built. Mind you, it cost $5 million dollars. And then sunk because of a hurricane that hit the ocean where it was floating. And then they had to basically rebuild everything that they couldn't get from the from the bottom of the ocean floor. But w- what I had no idea about was that Costner was meant to be this man fish hybrid. So kind of. Yes, like, I didn't know that you, either. I, I saw that. and I was like, wait, what? And he has webbed toes. It was just so weird. And it could have been interesting, but it just came off as just forced and odd. I, we I don't haven't... know. It, we haven't even said what the movie's about. The movie is about Kevin Costner as the oh, man. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if, yeah, because it eh, doesn't really matter. I mean, you should know what it's about by now if you've ever been to Universal Studios. True. Kevin Costner plays an unnamed protagonist, much like Mad Max kind of is. He's a drifter. Mm-hmm. His name is the Mariner, uh, and he's not from Seattle. That's also a baseball reference you won't get. And he goes into this sort of shanty town, floating shanty town, or as they call it, the atoll. Exactly. And finds a little girl who has a map tattooed on her back to the dry place. So this is apparently a place that isn't covered in water because Waterworld is exactly what it sounds like. The polar ice caps have melted and the earth is flooded with water, all water, all the time. Except if the polar ice caps did actually melt, it would only rise the sea levels about 100 feet. This wouldn't happen. Again, not the point. So she, yes, that's what I'm focusing on in this. 
I was like, oh yeah, that's that's really going to be the line that you draw. <laughs> I have drawn a line in the metaphorical sand because there is no sand because it's all water. But so this little girl has a the little girl is played by the actress the girl from uh, from Napoleon Dynamite. By the yeah, way, yeah, I <laughs> that either. I was looking at her. I was like, wait, she looks she looks kind of. That's what I thought. I was like, where have I seen you? And she plays Deb in Napoleon Dynamite. I was like, it blew my mind. But anyway, she has a tattoo on her back that is supposed to direct everybody to the dry place. How'd she get this tattoo? Not important. Don't think about it. Oh, you do find out in the end, which I thought was okay. Oh yeah, you do. And spoiler alert, they get to the dry place. They actually find land. But also, I don't know how she got off the... Okay, continue. Sorry. Don't think about it, Andrew. Yeah, you're right. We're on boats and Kevin Costner has fish gills. It's fine. (laughs) Dennis Hopper plays... Uh, a character called the Deacon who also wants this girl because she has the map tattooed on her. And so basically the plot revolves around Kevin Costner, keeping this girl safe and Jean Triplehorn plays the girls. It's not really explained adopted mother ward. You know, I'm not sure. Yeah. She sort of looks after her. she, she exactly. almost like a big sister in that way. And the whole movie is them escaping Dennis Hopper. Who's the best part of the movie he really while is. also trying to, you know, watch Kevin Costner not be a dick about stuff. I'm sorry, but if I was Kevin Costner, I had to listen to that little girl whine anymore. I probably would have thrown her overboard. No, too. he's so mean. He's so mean to her. No, she- bro. She's so annoying. I'm like, oh my God. And I love kids. He threw her over the <laughs> boat. He just tossed her off the side. I would have too. She was so annoying. All she did was draw some trees on his boat. She wanted to make it look nice. She I mean, was he being was, nice. He was pretty angry about the whole crayon debacle. All, that's all she wanted. She just wanted him to be nice, and he just slaps him around. She slaps her around so much. And I don't understand why he cut their hair. I, I don't understand. Yeah, as, why, punish, what, as punishment. Yeah, what, what was that? I don't know. Homegirl had cornrows, and now she just has frizz. Yeah, exactly. She really did look like a Raggedy Ann doll by the end. It's just such a weird film. But he's so off-putting. He is the reason why. His character is the reason why I did not like this movie because I actually didn't mind. The setting is kind of cool. I like the setting. I like that the world is all just one big ocean and they get around by these crazy elaborate boats. By the way, they I was very angry that they use jet skis in this and then they don't explain the where are they getting the fuel from, but they kind of do because the Deacon has, do, but it's... He has oil on his boat, so it's fine. It would have been interesting to see that they took over an oil derrick or something yes. in the middle of the, of the sea. Like ex, you could expand on the world a little bit more, which I, I completely agree. I was like, where are they getting the oil from? And then they touch on it with a like little the, bit. the dude who's, I guess he's the underworld God, the old he man. Is. And it blows up. He's like, oh, thank God. I was like, I know, dude, I'm glad they put you out of your misery. I did like that. He just goes, thank God. Yeah. He's just so over it. But I mean, he would die in in the matter of hours by yes. just snipping it. I, I don't understand. It makes no sense. <sighs> yeah. I, there's so much wrong with this. I Here's the thing. In the beginning, I was like, oh, it's starting out fairly interesting. I liked the beginning. I love the part where he pulls the lever and then his mast goes up. You get the impression that this man has been on the ocean for years and he's very good at what he does because sailboats are difficult to navigate alone. You need a hand, but he's found a way to do it alone, which only reinforces his own kind of reclusiveness. And I thought that was interesting. But then it just, after the atoll, and then you meet the old dude with the accent that takes the hot air balloon. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. After that whole thing happens, it just, it takes a dive. That was Michael Jeter. I did not know he was in this either. Yeah, I didn't know he was in this either. Yeah, he was better in Jurassic Park 3. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that was his crowd which did you favorite. like which did you like better this or jurassic park 3 oh jurassic park 3 are you kidding <laughs> i thought it was kevin costner Talking though. Velociraptors? i mean come on <laughs> then again the film does open with kevin costner peeing so and then drinking his piss so he I guess. does he also looks so goofy when he's like pedaling the boat with both his hands he looks ridiculous yeah it was just no i agree with you though i like the way it started i liked the opening action set piece i liked that he raced the other whatever they're called 
what's their names? Uh, the smokers. The smokers. I liked that he raced the smokers to the jar of dirt, and jars of dirt are commodities in this world, so he mm-hmm. can trade it for something good. But once but they get to the, the wild west nature of it, like when it he, was, yeah, when, when when he encounters the other drifter, as they call them, and and they establish that there's kind of a code where you must stop and trade something. I thought that was really cool. And, and mm-hmm. they were building the story. And, and I was thinking to myself, oh, well, this is this is interesting. And then it just it just devolves from there, though. Yeah. I... This movie, though, weirdly has a lot of similarities to Mad Max Fury Road. It's basically the same story. Oh, it is. When I was watching, I had no idea that it was initially written as a Mad because I had only seen the original Mad Max, the first one. I have not seen the Road Warriors, uh, the second Road one. Warrior. So I didn't I watched the first one after watching Fury Road and I thought to myself, well, this is n- I mean, it seemed as though he wanted to make Fury Road initially, but didn't have the budget or the means at that time to be able to do it. And so he created something that was almost a backyard pedestrian version of that film. That's what the first one was though. It was such a low budget shoot. The road warrior is a much better version of that. The road warrior is very good. Yeah. It seems like that was where sort of the style was developed for the new movie, the for fury road. Mm -hmm. That seems as though where, where it derived from because it definitely did not derive from the first film, but just watching it, I I was thinking to myself, Oh, this is very much Mad Max on water only to later find out that, Roger Corman literally wanted to make a B movie version of it. Oh yeah. It was literally the producers went, Hey, can you just give us a rip off of Mad Max? And then the writer was like, what about Mad Max? But with on boats <laughs> and they're like, Oh boy, have we struck gold? Everybody quit your day jobs. I, but it begs the question. When is universal studios going to learn not to shoot films at sea? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's Spielberg true. even warned Reynolds he's about shooting on the ocean. He was like, Reynolds asked him, he said, oh, what do you think about shooting this all in the ocean? And Spielberg's like, I'll never do it again. You might. Good luck. Have and fun. Spielberg's it's like, this you same, stupid idiot. It's the same studio. Like, oh my God, dudes. Yeah, but, but I will maybe say, they were I, thinking, hey, Jaws worked out pretty good for us. Which did this. Here's the thing is. Contrary to popular belief, this was not a flop. Domestically, it was a flop. Mm-hmm. It made $88 million, but internationally and then with home videos, it actually ended up making $264 million, and it was made for, what was that, $175 million? Yeah. Well, that's so what it they, wasn't necessarily... That's the reported budget. Who knows yeah. what the actual number was? I will say one thing, though, is that it felt as though it was the last movie of its kind from the standpoint of it being an epic that was shot practically. Something like this would not be made today. No. Um, I got a lot of Pirates of the Caribbean vibes to it, especially in the beginning when he goes into the atoll. He's coming into it. He's looking around his surroundings, kind of in the same way that Captain Jack does, not in as funny of a way. Yeah. Very similar, but Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl does have a lot of CGI to it. This was all practical. I did Mm -hmm. like this movie for that element i think that they should remake this movie this is a prime candidate to be a remake i agree yeah that i would completely agree with that because i was watching it and, and i thought to myself you know, this is a good concept this is this would look really cool if you just did it right and if it had a solid story yeah although you couldn't do the kevin costner dives to a sunken denver because that city that he dives in to get the dirt denver, that was based yeah. on denver mm-hmm which I thought, what an odd city to base on a sunken ruin is is on a mountain. Well, it is on a mountain. In the show, it's, or sorry, in the movie, it's not presented as Denver. No, no, I looked that up. I was thinking to myself because the, the actual dry land that they do find eventually is, and this wasn't included in the original cut, is actually Mount Everest. Yeah. Which I thought was interesting. But then it's re- revealed to you that the little girl's parents are the ones who gave her the tattoo and they're, yeah, they had right. this little hut there, but never explained how the girl got off the Island. I just thought of that. No, there aren't a lot of things in this that are explained, but which it feels like, but then again, in Mad Max, things aren't really explained either and no one cares, but Mad Max was really good. <laughs> So maybe that's the, that's the thing is that if it's good, I don't care. I don't care why Kevin, maybe I would care if Kevin Costner 
they don't explain why he has fish gills because that was very strange and off-putting. Why is no, he a mutant? Are other people I mean, mutants in this world? I, I would imagine that he is the first of many evolved human beings that are adapting to the world that is now the reality. So I, they I must be. I, I accepted it, and I actually that wasn't the part that I minded as much. It was more of the fact that humanity likely had lead time before everything flooded and thus would have likely created a better infrastructure. It, it wasn't like Noah's Ark where yeah. everything just flooded, right? So it would have been a slow evolution to get to that point, but I would have liked to have seen that sort of, because how do they have bullets? How are they, do they have? That's what I thought. I was like, those guns are going to jam. Yeah, exactly. I don't feel as though a film needs to explain everything. If anything, Waterworld explained more of the origin story of the world and how it arrived at the current reality. Whereas Mad Max omitted that element and only explain the parts of the world that were necessary to tell the story. What Waterworld lacked was an explanation for certain elements that were blatantly implausible or contradictory to the world that they've already presented or the world that they've already built, like the bullets or the oil. I I don't know. Overall, it, it was terrible. There were too many consistencies with the characters and it overall just didn't make sense. I see. I don't think it was overall just terrible because there was good elements in it, but it I was think just, it, I think it had a strong start. I will completely agree with that. It had a, it had a strong start and you can tell that the beginning was well written and well thought out, but you can see where the rewrites and the lack of ending began to muddy the water. No pun intended. I like this kind of a movie though, because it's a failure but it swung, man. It swung for the fences. It tried to hit the ball to the moon and it missed. But I do like that. I, I completely agree. I, despite its failure, I appreciate that it took the risk. And, and I think it was its redeeming quality, to be honest, where you walked away disappointed, but the premise itself was cool enough to ponder and fantasize about that it it was fine. I mean... I'm also a big supporter of films that are shot practically. A film like this these days would be shot in a soundstage surrounded by four green walls, where in this, they took the time and the money to build these giant sets that the actors could interact with and that felt that much more tangible. Than like a Jurassic World. Jurassic World is a perfect example. It it felt more like a video game than a film. I, I was acutely aware while watching it that none of it was real. And if anything, it looked worse than its predecessors, which comprise of, in my opinion, the perfect balance of CGI and practical. See, Jura- and Universal, perfect example. Universal should remake Jurassic Park or should redo Jurassic Park, but just do the book. Do it completely differently because Jurassic Park, the movie, you can't recapture that, man. You can't do it. So you may as well just take Jurassic Park and take the name recognition and remake it as a techno thriller as like a HBO series or something. Cause they keep trying, they keep trying to make Jurassic park and they keep failing at it. The failure of Jurassic world, in my opinion is twofold. The first of which I've mentioned to you in the past, it went from being a sci-fi about the unpredictability and indifference of mother nature and wild animals. And then involved into a monster movie where the dinosaurs were more conscious and could distinguish between, Oh, Hey, I know that guy. I won't eat him. Where the first and second films emphasize that these animals act solely on instinct. You have a weird love for the second Jurassic park. In You love it more than anyone else. I know you it's like it. I love it. I, I just don't think it was as bad as people say it is. It was fun. And it also was a big, a big part of my childhood. I love that movie when I first saw it. It was also one of the first movies I saw in theaters. No kidding. Really? Well, at least one of the first I remember. You remember the first movie you saw in theater? Uh, I believe it was Home Alone 2. I was three years old. I have like snapshot memories of which theater we saw it at, where we sat in the theater. And then I remember falling asleep and then getting woken up at the end and crying, saying, I want Kevin, I want Kevin. Really? Yeah. Because 
Jurassic Park was actually the second movie I ever saw in a theater. I remember you telling me, uh-huh. you telling me the first that. one that I can remember was the Lion King. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Wait, what year did that come out? Lion King came out in 1993 and Jurassic Park yeah. came out. Uh, no, the Lion King came out in 1994 and Jurassic Park came out in 1993, but Jurassic Park was still in theaters at that yeah. point. Yeah. But the other part about Jurassic World that I think is an issue is the obsession with interconnected universes. And I think that that's der- a derivative of the Marvel universe. And so Jurassic World is trying to do the same thing where they're bringing back old characters to do cameos in the new movies. Yeah. And, and all these characters carry through the entire storyline. And I, I just... I don't know. I, I have a problem with that. I think Star Wars did the same thing. Whereas what I loved about the Mandalorian is that it, it took the same world that was established in the original and then explored a different story within that world. It didn't necessarily tie into the Skywalker saga in a sense, which it might later down the line, but I like that at least, at least it starts out where it's more of a, I mean it, the Mandalorian exists in the time period after return of the Jedi, but before force awakens. So it kind of, can't unless luke skywalker were to make an appearance so it really can't exist in the skywalker saga it exists in the in-between time which i yeah. like especially I... um Werner herzog's kind of stormtrooper cabal mm-hmm. and you can see their armor is you know loose it's dirty mm-hmm. it's after exactly after the empire has fallen i love the mandalorian i can't wait for season two well the new trilogy is technically still part of the skywalker saga but you're right. It does take place in between. And I'm so excited for the second season of The Mandalorian. Do you have a bad movie that you wish got remade into something good? Hmm. I'd have to think about that. It's a good question. Do you have one in mind? So my initial thought was the movie Public Enemies with Johnny Depp as John Dillinger. And it was mm. a Michael Mann movie. Christian Bale uh, is the FBI agent trying to hunt him down. And I remember coming out of the theater going, oh, it wasn't as good as I wanted it to be. Yeah. And I was really excited for it. But that's the, definitely the one that first came to mind. There are a couple, though. I mean, the League, Extraordin- the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen is one that has such a great premise that is also a notorious disaster of a film. I also thought, I mean, Hancock is one that had such a great premise of Will Smith is a superhero who just hates being a superhero. And the first half of that movie is great. And the second mm-hmm. half where he meets Shelley's there and she also turns out to be a superhero and they're like drawn together in this weird way. That's never explained. That's not very good. But the first half of that movie is genius. I felt like bright, bright could be remade. Bright could have been remade. I bright. loved bright. I actually, I, I mean, what? I really did. Yeah, I, I love the the concept. I love the oh. premise. I love the world. Uh, I just I remember it ending and me thinking to myself, mm, it could have been way better. I, I oh, really it should have been. Like it. I just wish wish it was done in a better way. The world and the the creation of this setting could have been great. The race relations stuff wasn't eh, like that pulled everything down so much. Yeah, it, it was heavy handed and in your face about it, but. It wasn't so much that as much as uh, it just felt very shallow. It, it left me wanting more than what we actually got. Oh, it was all shallow and it was just all surface level. And that was the problem with it is it was such a waste of a great world. The movie In Time with Justin Timberlake, too, where everybody has these mm-hmm. these clocks on their arms and they live until the clock on their arm hits zero and then they die, but they don't age past 25 in appearance. It was such a great world and such a disappointing movie that. I mean, that could have been really great if it was just done better. I think about that with Jumper, too, the Hayden Christensen movie. Oh, God. I don't mind that movie. I have a weird soft spot in my heart for that movie. Why don't, don't you? You don't like it? I, I don't remember <laughs> if I great. like it or not, but uh, Hayden Christensen just annoys the hell out of me. That dude, man. He's just so melodramatic. Like, just smile. Don't worry about it. It's not his fault that he had to be in Attack of the Clones. You can't blame him. He was yeah. very good in Shattered Glass. I didn't even see Shattered Glass. But oh, I felt no, like he was the good. same character in Jumper. He was just whiny and just, I don't know. 
Jumper has a great premise. Yeah. That gets squandered by the kind of by the love story too. No, I mean I liked the love story in it. I didn't mind it that he goes back and Rachel Bilson is kind of this girl that he knew and now he's got this ability and they just jump throughout the world. I was excited about the film because I did like the premise. I just didn't enjoy the its execution. I, I just made... No, the execution wasn't great. That was made by Doug Lyman too, which is strange. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. A rare misfire from Doug Lyman. No, I was going to say Live, Die, Repeat. I love that movie. I just wish the ending. You can tell the ending was not meant to be was not meant to be what it was. Oh, they should never make remake that movie because that movie is shocking that it's as good as it is. A time loop movie like that. Oh, there's so much risk there. There is a lot of risk, and we should have actually mentioned it in the last episode. Yeah, we should have. But it was so good, and the ending needs to be remade. I hate that the studio interfered and forced them to do the, oh, everything's fine, Hollywood ending. I also thought of the movie Open Water, which could have been great, too. <laughs> you are a crazy person. So <laughs> what, what about that could be great? It's a good premise. It's just a couple <laughs> floating along in the ocean. There's nothing around. It's desolate. There is no hope. And they're being hunted by a shark. Now, I don't think the movie itself is good. But that's a really good, intense premise for something that could be like a really tight thriller. This is interesting. Has there ever been a shark movie that has been truly great since Jaws? What was that Jason Statham movie where he fights the Megalodon? It's hard to do sharks really well. You can do them goofy. But to actually capture the terror that is Jaws... After Jaws, there isn't there isn't much you can do. After Jaws, there I mean, what, I don't know where else you can go with it to make it unique and different, other than turning them into a tornado. <laughs> like it's true. I mean, creature features like that would be difficult to pull off. And a shark, you really only have one spot. Like if you drive fifteen minutes away from the beach, you've won. Yeah, and I think that that's what Sharknado was trying to uh... <laughs> trying to accomplish. I mean, some might argue with us that. Open Water is a good movie. We have a friend who argues <laughs> that Open not, Water... Not some, one. <laughs> we have one friend who argues that Open Water is a cinema masterpiece, the like of which the world has never seen the like of which. And really, it's a compelling argument. It's not a compelling no, he, argument. He does not have a compelling argument. All right, let's get this straight. It's an interesting <laughs> argument to listen to a man try to defend the cinematic merits of the movie Open Water. Yeah. But ultimately, I think you could do open water better, is what I'm saying. You can't stretch it out for for 90 minutes, in my opinion. I mean, they stretched out Ryan Reynolds in a coffin with just a lighter and a cell phone for 80 minutes. Yeah, they also, buried. They also did Locke. Locke. But there was mm-hmm. built-in drama in Locke and Buried, where they at least had contact to the outside world via phones. There's nothing you can do while you're stranded in the ocean than float around and almost get eaten a few times. Plus, there's no way you survive that. There's nothing stopping the shark from eating you at that point. The love that they have for one another will keep them safe. Lord, don't they get divorced or break up at the end or something like that? Yeah, they don't really have a good time of it in the open water. Yeah. (laughs) Things don't go well. (laughs) At that point, it would be every man for himself. I don't need to outswim the shark. I just need to outswim you. Basically. Which, which should but be the still, way that, but I still love be the you. way that most, most divorces are settled now. Yes. <laughs> throw them in a tank of sharks and whoever lives gets everything. <laughs> Simple and easy. <laughs> Simple and easy. <laughs> what if none of them survive? Well, then yeah. it looks like we've just acquired some stuff. <laughs> it's, it's Hunger Games, but with sharks. <laughs> but we move from one dystopian future to another because the next thing we want to talk about is something that I have not seen and you have. And that was The Girl with All the Gifts from 2016. Yeah, so I had been meaning to watch The Girl with All the Gifts. And when I was deciding which movie to watch for this episode, it was between this and Train to Busan, funny enough. Uh, I I do still plan to watch Train to Busan because I've heard great things about it. But at its core, The Girl with All the Gifts is a zombie flick. Uh, Do do you know anything about this, Joe? I know nothing about this. I know that it's a fungus that infects everybody. And it turns them into basically cannibalistic zombies. That's all I know. I think from what I remember, 
it's kind of a similar story to the passage or to the stand where there's a girl who is, or even children of men in that way, where it's Mm -hmm. like an escort where a kind of a group or a soldier, I think he's a soldier needs to escort this girl who is the savior to humanity from point A to point B. Yes. Very similar in that it is an escort the savior type film, but it begins in what seems like an underground military base where a, group of children are being held and the soldiers and scientists are treating these kids as if they're hostile for some reason, holding them in cells. And when they leave the cells, they're required to be strapped into wheelchairs that restrain their arms, legs and heads. So every day they're picked up from their holding cells and wheeled to a classroom. And by the looks of it, they're just normal kids with the exception of how they're being treated until one of the teachers, Miss Justino, touches the main character Melanie's head. At which point, a military sergeant bursts into the room and yells at the teacher for touching the kid. And the teacher retorts with, you know, they're they're just kids. And the sergeant says, no, they're monsters taking the form of children. He then spits on his arm and rubs it in and holds his arm up to one of the kids. And when the other kids are, begin to smell his scent, most of them, half of the kids, turn feral. And their jaws just start snapping and they're trying to break out of the restraints and they're, they're these like mindless animals. And you realize these kids are actually zombies and are triggered by the scent of humans. So all the humans on the base must wear this blocker cream that hides their scent, which I thought was so cool. That's fun. That's new. I was about to ask you, what's the new thing that this brings to zombies? Because we're all zombied out. That's a nice twist. Yeah, it definitely distinguishes itself from other zombie films that we've seen, especially since we're entering the story about 10 years or so after the outbreak. And so the first act focuses on some of the ways in which they're dealing with the new reality, as well as sort of the day to day operations on the base. And at one point, you see other zombies outside of the fences of the base. And they're different from the kids in that they're the typical mindless monsters that we're used to seeing in zombie films. And it's explained to us that these kids are part of a new generation or second generation of zombies. And Dr. Caldwell, played by Glenn Close, she's the lead scientist working on a cure or sort of a vaccine for the sickness. And Melanie, our main character, is the key to her research. And that's because Melanie exhibits unique traits and she's incredibly smart and seems to be able to control her urges to eat humans or eat flesh and the first act ends when dr caldwell is about to dissect melanie in order to create the vaccine but is interrupted when the base is overrun by zombies so dr caldwell the sergeant melanie our main character and miss justino the teacher that sort of has kind of a protective connection with with melanie escape along with two other soldiers and the film goes on from there as they try to find refuge on another base located on the other side of london so they have to kind of travel through london which is highly populated with zombies but what i liked about this is that it's different from other zombie films in that the disease isn't a virus and it's actually a fungus that takes over the human mind and it's actually based in real life yes i re- i remember this i read this too where it's a dormant fungus that actually exists though yeah and it's terrifying i i remember seeing the national geographic video on this fungus and it's crazy that this is a thing that actually exists in nature and it primarily infects ants and it's called let's see if i can get this right ophiocordyceps unilateris otherwise known as a zombie parasite and it basically takes over the body of the ant and the ant gets the impulse to crawl to the lower levels of the forest that are much more humid and are optimal for fungus growth and then forces them to latch onto a branch with their pincers at which point it will rot from the inside out and the fungus grows out out of the brain and the body of the ant in order to release more spores and infect other ants. And so in the movie where we actually see the zombies do the same exact thing where they're, they congregate at the base of this tall structure in the middle of London and the fungus grows out of their bodies, out of the zombies bodies into these vines, these long vines that grow up this giant tower. And so there's this giant structure that's just made up of fungus vines and on the vines are hanging these giant mango looking spores that have a hard shell that if exposed to extreme heat or moisture would burst open and spread the fungus into the air now i'm going to spoilers right now so if you're going to watch this definitely skip three minutes forward uh because it i definitely do recommend 
you watch it and then not know the ending because it is a great ending. So they find other kids like the ones on the base, but in the city. But because they haven't had any adult influence, they've had to create their own language of grunts and sort of a hierarchy in the same way that Lord of the Flies does it with this alpha zombie. And Melanie kind of sees more of her kind are out there. And so the central question posed by the scientists in the movie is if the kids are controlled by the fungus and just have learned to mimic human behavior in order to to draw them in and infect them, or if the fungus and the human brain have created a symbiotic relationship. And over the course of the movie, they go from treating Melanie like an animal to seeing her humanity because she helps them through the course of the journey because she can navigate through the zombie infested streets without being in danger. And so she helps them clear the way. And at the peak of the second act, after Melanie sees that there are a bunch of kids just like her who have grown to coexist with the fungus, she's about to sacrifice herself to the doctor for the cure to humanity. But asks the doctor one last question and she says do you still believe i'm being controlled by the fungus or am i real and the doctor tells her that she believes she is real and she has her own consciousness and and personality to which melanie says well then why should we die for you then she takes a box of matches and ends up setting the giant fungus vines on fire thus releasing the spores into the air and spreading the virus even further. That is bleak. What is this movie? This is so bizarre. Yeah, man, it is such a good, it is such a fresh take on the zombie genre. Because the zombies win. Sort of like I Am Legend, or at least the original story of I Am Legend. That's true. Boy, that's a movie that should be remade too. Because yeah, it is I Am Legend. Yeah, and in a sense, it felt like a metaphor for generational change in a way where the old generation of humans is holding fast to the status quo, but it's now the new generation's time to take charge and abandon the old ways and embrace a new vision for the world. And Melanie ends up protecting the teacher, Miss Justino, whom she had a connection to and who had protected Melanie from being dissected by the doctor throughout the entire movie by locking Miss Justino in this mobile f- lab that they come across and it's airlocked. So when she goes and releases all the spores, Miss Justino can't be infected. And so the teacher's trapped there for eternity alone because if she were to leave, she would become infected. And so Melanie gathers the other kids like her outside of the lab every day. Sure. And Miss Justino ends up teaching all the kids and educating them through the glass. So it's kind of cool to see the movie starting out with the kids being the ones who are confined only to serve the needs of humans and ends with the last human being confined forced to serve the needs of the new generation of human fungus hybrids you know what i found off-putting about this knowing nothing about it is the title though it seems like it came out in the middle of that craze of things with girl in the title Girl on the Train, Gone Girl, 2016, it was in the middle of all of that. So I think it probably got lost in that shuffle of thrillers with girl in the title. The Girl Who Fell From Earth is one of them. Yeah, it definitely seemed like it it got lost in all of that. And it was also a a British film, so it likely didn't get as much attention. Yeah. But the girl that plays Melanie, Sanaya Nanua, did such an amazing job. And this was her breakout role. And to carry the entire film on her shoulders. She's in every scene and you see her making decisions for the character. And it, it, she did such a great job. I, I was very impressed by her. Would you describe this as fun or is it more of a ponderous? No, no, it's, it's very dramatic. Oh, really? Okay. Because when you mentioned Train to Busan earlier, Train to Busan is zombie movie, but basically it's zombies on a train. That's what it is. We're on a train. We're going to Busan. There are zombies on the train. And I would describe Train to Busan as a fun movie. Yeah, the, it definitely wasn't that. There were a few scenes in which they're fighting zombies, but this was a lot more contemplative in a way. The one thing I wish they would have included, though, was whether or not the rest of the world is infected. Because without that information, the ending doesn't have as much of an impact. Because for her to release the spores into the air, if every country is already infected, yeah, what'd then be the what's point? the point? Exactly. Yeah, there are very few people left to infect. Yeah, and at that point, if you're blowing up a big tree where the spores are going to float around, you can basically toss a rock and hit France from London. I mean, it can float 
uh, over to the rest of Europe easily. Yeah. For instance, if, if Britain was isolated and by releasing the spores, she's ensured the spread to the rest of the world, then that is so much more shocking and, and kind of more impactful. It doesn't seem like a fun sit. I'll be honest. Seems like you got to be in a real mood to go, you know what I want to watch today? I'm going to sit down with my burrito and my two liter bottle of Coke and really get into Girl with All the Gifts. <laughs> yeah, you you definitely have to be in a mood to watch this. But I will say it is a perfect balance of high concept monster movie and intellectual sci-fi. It definitely engages you in, in more than one way. But to wrap up, I, I would say the part that made this a perfect pair with Waterworld is the concept of our main character being part of the new generation of humans who have evolved to acclimate to the new world and end up distancing themselves from the past generation in the way that Melanie chooses to foster her own kind rather than the old generation of humans and the Mariner leaving at the end of Waterworld because he is a hybrid of man and fish and doesn't feel at home with humans. But with that, we'd love to hear from you. Have you watched Cursed, Waterworld, The Girl with All the Gifts, or anything else we mentioned? If so, what were your thoughts? Did you agree or disagree with anything we discussed? Let us know on YouTube, Instagram, or Twitter. You can find all those links on channel 8 com. That's channel 8 and a half, completely spelled out, dot com. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider liking and sharing with family and friends. We have new episodes every Thursday. Until next time, my name is Joe Galino. And I'm Andrew Hanna, and this is channel 8 and a half.